Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Elsa Sunset. I'm a stroke neurologist from Oslo and uh, the Secretary General of the European Stroke Organization. With me here today, I have uh, Sridra Kodali, a medical student from Yale, Yale University. Uh, she has just completed her uh, first plenary session presentation at an international stroke conference. And today we will discuss her work on multi-trajectory modeling of blood pressure after thrombectomy. So, uh, Srija, first I have to congratulate you on a major achievement and the presentation of very nice data. Can you please briefly tell us, uh, give us a quick summary of, uh, of uh, what you found and what you have done? Sure. Firstly, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, our study was an observational cohort study where we analyzed individual level patient blood pressure data from 11 comprehensive stroke centers in the US, France, Germany, and South Korea. Our goal was to generate distinct systolic blood pressure trajectories 72 hours after thrombectomy and understand the association with these trajectories and outcome. What we ultimately found was that these trajectory groups were significantly associated with functional outcome at 90 days, as well as symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. Um, more specifically, patients with persistently high blood pressure over time fared worse than patients with moderate or low blood pressure courses. I think the way you have done this and also the, the, the figures that you have presented, they're beautiful figures that are very intuitive to look at and, and it gives you a great overview of the, of the different trajectories of blood pressure in the first 72 hours. If you are to take, give a couple of take home messages from your presentation, what would you say are the most important things uh, that you want people to know from your presentation? For sure. I think what our findings highlight is that patients can have variable and distinct blood pressure courses after thrombectomy. And they highlight the importance of shifting away from one size fits all blood pressure strategies towards more individualized or tailored hemodynamic management. I think this is music in my ears. So I, I completely agree on, <laughs> on, 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 uh, on that, that blood pressure is very individual and, and patients come in and uh, you can have a patient with very high blood pressure and they have previous hypertension and so on and you have to tailor tailor your treatment according i think that's the way we are going to move when it comes to blood pressure uh, so but what do you think explains your results how do you how do you, what do you think can explain that the patients in the high trajectories in the first 72 hours with high blood pressure over over the 72 hours why do you think they do worse than patients with uh, with uh, the lower blood pressures that's a great question um what we found in our analyses is that patients in the highest trajectory group tended to have higher rates of pre-existing hypertension but that wasn't sufficient to explain their outcomes or their group membership we also found that they were often treated with antihypertensive medication, but not as much as, let's say, the um, more moderate trajectory groups. Um, why they fared worse? We were thinking that perhaps uh, hemorrhage could be a mechanism through which high blood pressure could lead to poor functional outcome. However, we found the trend of functional outcome didn't exactly match that of hemorrhage. And in fact, folks with the higher hemorrhage actually were the moderate to high trajectory group, or sorry, were the high to moderate, mixing them up. Um, so, in, so in summary, folks with the highest blood pressure didn't actually have the highest rates of hemorrhage. So I think that is definitely an area we are interested in exploring what is the mechanism through which folks end up with worse outcomes. So in, in your, you, you had a, a, a large number of patients, I think uh, around 81% of the patients were uh, achieved recanalization. Mm -hmm. Have you looked into any data, have you looked into the data to see whether there was a different rate of recanalization in the different trajectories? Yeah, we have looked into that. Um, what we found was there were different rates in recanalization, but it didn't achieve significance and it didn't 
actually, when we replotted the trajectories, separating folks by recanalization status didn't greatly change the shape of these trajectories. Okay. So while there is definitely something at play where folks with higher blood pressure perhaps were not recanalized at higher rates, it doesn't explain everything. No, I think I think it's it's uh, that we have so much to learn uh, uh, about the patients with the high blood pressure, why their uh, that blood pressure is persistently high, and why we can't get it's it's difficult to achieve. Uh, uh, if you go for a target, it's difficult to get them to down to a target, and they are they are treatment resistant in many ways, and and. I, I wonder if, if in some way these patients, this is, is, is a representative of a, something different happening in their brain than the patients with the more more lower blood pressure that also do them better. So I think it, it's, a, it's an area where we, we don't really, whether there is still, there's been so much research on the topic, but we still have a long way to go to understand what is actually happening in these patients and also whether we should should lower the blood pressure in these patients and, and especially how much we should lower and how we should tailor this and, and management, manage this in, in, in patients with a high blood pressure, not only for during endovascular treatment, but also, also in, in, uh, in uh, stroke, stroke or, or ischemic stroke in general. Mm -hmm. So what would you classify as your major, the major limitations of your, uh, of, uh, your, your project? Sure. Um, we had a very large sample size and an international cohort, which is great, but comes with the drawback of institutional variability when it comes to thrombectomy selection criteria or post-procedural imaging protocols. Ultimately, we're quite grateful for this cohort size because it allowed us to generate the trajectories most accurately and also increases the generalizability of our findings. And another limitation is, like many observational studies, um, we had some missing data, but we conducted multiple imputations to address this and found that the findings held in both the original data set as well as in the imputed data set. That, that is reassuring. And uh, did you have blood pressure data for the 72 hours on, on all the patients? Uh, or you said you have some, some missing, but, but uh, what, what, how many patients were included in the final analysis? Was that uh, 2,500 or did you have to exclude some patients? Um, we ended up, I think it was 2,268 yeah. patients that were included in the final analysis. And yeah, some patients didn't make the final cut if they did not have blood pressure recordings in that time window. Okay, I think you answered that really well. And you obviously have very good knowledge of the data. So you, you've worked quite hard with these data. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's very fun and uh, good to get to learn your own data set. I, it seems like you think so. <laughs> uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, so uh, my final question to you today is based on the, this project uh, and the other, other available evidence, what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts of the importance of blood pressure in the setting of endovascular treatment? It's a great question. I think our findings indicate that blood pressure is a very important and like modifiable parameter in the acute stroke window. Um, and we are excited to move towards more specific guidance on how we can manage blood pressure and, and eventually realize improved patient outcomes. I think our findings set up, lay the groundwork and set up towards a future blood pressure controlled trial. Although this was observational, we might be able to better identify ideal candidates for future trials. Um, one, a few questions that are still remaining are, can we identify the high risk patients early on? And if so, can we enrich an intervention cohort in a future trial with these high risk folks? Another question that's sort of on everyone's minds is, even if you identify high risk folks, does moving them from a high trajectory group to a more moderate trajectory group, will this achieve an improvement in outcomes? And I think this would need to be tested in a blood pressure modulation trial. But again, I think these findings move us towards identifying more ideal candidates and helping us resolve these questions on what good blood pressure management can look like and hopefully help patients. Yeah, I agree on that too. So, and I would like to thank you very much uh, for your time and also 
big congratulations on the major achievement, both with the, with the, the, the project and, and the presentation. And uh, I hope we can meet uh, sometime somewhere around the world and that uh, this has also sparked your interest in, in, in the stroke in the long term and also research. For sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Sansa. And thank you so much for this platform and opportunity. Okay. Thank you.